out. I know that's hard to do, especially on a weekday evening when the weather's nice and you might rather be taking a walk or uh, walk your dog, play with the kids. Um, as she said, I'm Lisa Huckins. I'm with the Ohio Department of Education, and I work in an office called the Office of Non-Public Educational Options, which the majority, let's say 90% of the students in Ohio go to public schools of some kind or another. Our office handles uh, homeschooling, private schools, scholarship programs, sort of everything that is not public school. So that's what I do there. Um, I work with several different programs and have over the years. So we're going to kind of start broad and just talk about how education works in Ohio. Then we're going to drill down and talk very specifically about the John Peterson Scholarship and how that works. That is the scholarship that students with special needs can access specifically. So in Ohio, we are what I like to call very choicey. Uh, you have lots of choices for education for your children in Ohio. Not all states have these options. So families coming in from other states are sometimes a little overwhelmed, and certainly those of us who live here have a lot of opportunity for choices. But with all those choices come a little bit of confusion and sometimes being overwhelmed. Um, if you've ever been in Whole Foods and gone to the cheese section, you get the same kind of feeling. Um, great that we have all these cheeses. Bad that I have no idea what 70% of them are or whether I'll like them or not. So kind of the same problem as a parent with education, only certainly more severe consequences for choosing a smelly cheese. Um, the options we have are obviously public schools. Those are open to everyone. They are usually assigned based on your neighborhood address. But within your district, you may have open enrollment choices. Cincinnati Public from seventh grade up lets you select a school. They have lottery schools, magnet schools, things like that. And then there are some districts that let you enroll from another district into their district. Columbus Public Schools allows students from neighboring districts to come in. That's a district choice. Then there are community schools, what everyone likes to call charter schools, but in Ohio they're technically community schools. Those are also public schools, so they accept any student who comes to them. They are free of charge, and they basically follow similar rules to what your public school district does with IDEA rules. Um, providing free appropriate public education to students with disabilities, writing an IEP. Private schools are run by private organizations. They charge tuition, typically, to attend those schools, and some of them can be religious. Not all of them are, but I would say actually the majority in Ohio are religious of some kind. We also have scholarships in Ohio, which is what we're going to really talk about tonight, and those are an option to help families pay for private school. Private schools have always existed, uh, but not for most families where those are a real common option because they cost money and sometimes cost a lot of money, and not every family has that kind of money to put towards their child's education. So Ohio's come up with these scholarships that are an option to help families afford the option of private schools. Then there's homeschooling. That is where a parent chooses to educate a child themselves. They may not do all of the education themselves. They might have a neighbor that they work with, and the neighbor's good at science, and they're good at language arts, and they share educating their kids. Or they might hire a tutor. But essentially, the parent is taking charge of their child's education and schooling them at home. Uh, and then there's Career Technical and College Credit Plus. If you have older kids, this actually now starts in seventh grade, potentially. Career Technical programs. Um, used to be things like um, pre-nursing programs, auto mechanics, they have expanded to robotics, uh, communications, visual arts programs, engineering programs, so they've really expanded what your kiddos can do in career tech options, and they start as young as possibly seventh grade in some areas. And then College Credit Plus is college classes that students take during high school to earn college credit. We've added a new tool to ODE's website called the Find a School Tool that's designed to help parents work through some of this. So if you're wondering what your choices are in your county, you can go on ODE's website, which we'll have at the end of the program, but it's just education.ohio.gov, or you can Google it. And on the front page, you're going to see this Find a School Tool. And it allows you to select either elementary or up through high school. A type of school, traditional public schools, community schools, or chartered non-public schools, which is what we in Ohio call private schools, because we're the government, we like long names. Um, and you can select your county, select schools within your county that you're interested in, or look at all of them. 
and it'll bring them up. If it is a public school of any kind, either a charter school or a traditional public school, and you click on it, it's going to show you their report card. Gives you very basic information. And then you can click on that report card and open it up to say, for instance, how they're doing for students with disabilities. Sometimes you can have an A-rated district that's doing an F level of work, according to their report card, in the area of students with disabilities. So you want to look at what you're concerned about when you're looking at these report cards. So if you click on that button, it'll let you drill in. So you can kind of compare the ratings of the schools. This isn't the end-all, be-all decision maker for whether a school is doing well or not. Um, obviously, you'd have to visit and look at some more factors, but it can give you some information. And then we have these scholarship options. More specifically, for if you choose not to go the public school route and want to try either homeschooling or private school, for private schools, there are three general education scholarships. So these are not necessarily special education based, but a student who has special needs could still participate in them. The oldest is the Cleveland Scholarship. Any student who lives in the city of Cleveland, in the Cleveland Municipal School District, is eligible for a scholarship. $46.50 for K through eight, and $6,000 for high school. So it's really easy eligibility. So if you have friends in Cleveland and they don't know about it, you can tell them. Then there's the Educational Choice Scholarship. This one has been around for about 10, 12 years now. And that is based on your local neighborhood public school. Any student who is going to be attending for kindergarten or is already attending based on their neighborhood assignment, say a Cincinnati public school that is not doing very well academically on those report cards, can qualify for that scholarship. Again, $46.50 for K-8, to $6,000 for high school, that you can take to purchase tuition at a participating private school. And special needs kiddos can participate in these scholarships also if they want to. The educational choice expansion. Say you're living in a district where the schools are performing very well, but you just want to try private school for religious reasons or because you have one close to you that's great. That is based on income. Our income limit for that is 200% of federal poverty. For a family of four, that's about $50,000 a year. So it's pretty high. Uh, the autism scholarship is specifically for students whose primary disability category is autism. That scholarship starts at age three. All the rest are school age through 12th grade. Um, so five through 12th grade. The autism starts at age three, so preschoolers can participate. And then we have the John Peterson Special Needs Scholarship, which is for any student who has a disability and qualifies for an IEP with their local district. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about. Is there a specific use case where you can combine multiple scholarships? There is not. So it's one or the other? Yes, you There's can only no... choose one. So the process for participating in basically any of these scholarships, but definitely for the John Peterson, which is what we're going to focus on, starts with working with your district, then finding a provider, and then submitting your application. And we're going to talk through how that goes. Uh, working with your district starts with an evaluation. Starting at age three, your public school district is required to evaluate any student that they suspect has a disability. They have to evaluate. If they evaluate that student and find out that that student qualifies for special education, and most of you are probably very familiar with this process already, they can get an IEP or an individualized education program, or possibly if they're in private school already, a service plan. And we'll talk about those. They are not the same as an IEP. The IEP is supposed to offer your child FAPE, a free appropriate public education which is any of those supports or services that your child needs to participate in the curriculum at their school. And you have reporting requirements with your district, even if you get on scholarship, like letting them know if you move and keeping in touch with them. So even if you decide to opt out of your public school district and choose one of these scholarships like the John Peterson, this whole process will still happen the way it happens now through the public school district. Students in private schools still generate funds through auxiliary services and IDEAB. Auxiliary service funds are state funds that go to private schools. 
So even if your child goes to a private school and accepts one of these scholarships to help pay for it, they are still potentially entitled to services through these auxiliary funds that are state funds or the federal IDEA funds. There's a part of that money that comes into your public school district that's given to your private school. What that means is that your child may have a service plan created for them at the private school as well as having an IEP that was created for them through the public school. The public school works with your private school to create that. It can only be for services that are not already on your IEP. So a lot of people like to call the service plan the private school IEP. It's not the same because it has not the same legal standing as an IEP. When your district writes an IEP for you, it has to include everything your child needs. So if an evaluation shows that your child needs speech therapy, that has to go on the IEP. If the evaluation shows that your child needs physical therapy, that has to go on the IEP. When you go into a private school setting, there's those auxiliary and IDEA funds coming into that private school to help kids with special needs, and they can use the auxiliary for some other stuff. And they can choose to use that money in the private school to write a service plan, which they might say, you know what, we're going to provide that speech that we know your child needs, but we're not going to do the occupational therapy or physical therapy or some of those other things, because there's just not enough money, or because we want to give more money to this other school and each child doesn't have a specific right to a certain amount of that money. So theoretically, if I'm Cincinnati Public Schools, I could take all of my IDEAB money and spend it at one private school and not give any to the other kids. It's not typically how they do it, but it's not the same as an IEP where every child has to get what they need. It's more of an agreement that, hey, here's what we will do, not what we have to do. But on scholarship you could get that. That's the other reason why a child might choose to go on an Ed Choice scholarship because they can still possibly get some services through this. It's not as guaranteed as using a Peterson scholarship. The other thing the district's responsible for in your life through these programs is giving you a notification form that these scholarships exist so every time you have an ETR or IEP meeting with the district they should be handing you a notification that says, hey, you're eligible for a scholarship. Early on, I had a parent who called me and she was really upset because she thought her district was trying to get rid of her. And she said, they keep giving me this form. I think they want me to leave. I said, why do you think that? Well, they keep giving me the form. I said, well, they have to give you the form by law. And she's like, oh, good, because I really like them and I thought we were getting along great. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, it's the law. They have to give you that form to tell you this exists. They also have to give you what's called the fake comparison chart. That's one of the handouts here today. That tells you what the difference is between being in a public school or being on a scholarship as it relates to your rights. Is it this one? Um, this one. I'll hold that one up. Thank you. That's the FAPE comparison chart. What that says is when you accept one of these scholarships to go to a private school, you have a lot of freedom. You get some money to spend and you can use that to kind of purchase what you want instead of do what the district wants and you can choose which private school to go to. You don't have to go to your neighborhood school, but it also does take away your rights under IDEA for a free appropriate public education. So you are giving something up too. The eligibility requirements for Peterson, we hit up this a little bit, but you have to be school age, five years, um, and less than 22 or not graduated either way. You have to be identified by your district as a child with a disability. You have to have a current agreed upon IEP with your district. So if the district writes an IEP and you're like, I'm not signing that, that's terrible. I'm gonna go get Peterson. That's not gonna work. You gotta stop and go back and get to an agreed upon IEP. Then you can take that IEP and come to Peterson and say, I'm gonna get this scholarship and here's what I need for my child that I've got in this IEP. And then you have to be compliant with compulsory attendance, and we'll talk more about that piece later. I always say that the key to whether the scholarship is a good choice for your child or not is the providers in your area. If there is a provider in your area that can meet your child's needs and can meet them better than your local public school is, then it's a great option. It can be a terrific option for you. If there's not, then it's not going to help a whole lot. 
Um, you know, you don't want to leave your public school district if there's not a better place to go to. And so we have a wide array of providers that participate in these programs. And if you go onto ODE's website and search the John Peterson Scholarship, there is a tool called the Provider Search Tool. And you can put in a provider name if you want to look into information about a specific provider that you've heard of. Or you can just put in your county or your neighboring counties and select specific services that you want to look at if you really want to make sure that wherever you go has occupational therapy. You can indicate specific services you need and then just hit the search key. And it's going to bring up all the providers that offer those services in your county. Or again, you can look all over the county. What you'll see is we have kind of an a la carte menu. As a parent, you can choose one provider or you can choose many. If your medical insurance is able to cover your speech therapy, then maybe you don't need that from your provider. So maybe you choose a school program that just does the academic intervention piece and you do your speech therapy after school. That's an option. Or maybe you find a school that has an intervention specialist in a speech therapy, but your child also needs occupational therapy and they don't offer that. So you could choose a second provider that does the occupational therapy. I do have some families on the Autism Scholarship. I think the highest I've counted was 10 providers at one time. I don't know how they managed keeping their funds straight. Um, but you can have more than one provider. So you can kind of build a menu of services that meet your child's needs. Um, typically, when we see a lot of providers, it can be a, a situation where a parent's chosen to homeschool their child and then bring in different services. Maybe they have a behaviorist come in and do ABA therapy. And then they also have a speech therapist and an occupational therapist that they go to. And maybe they have an academic tutor that comes in. So you can go through these and build your menu. I would like to point out there are little red asterisks next to some of these providers. When you see that, that means that program is a school. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Some of them look like schools. And if you go visit them, they're there from 9 to 3. They have teachers in the classroom. Um, small group setting, but they may not necessarily be actually legally a school. So that can be important with that compulsory attendance piece that we'll talk about. If you find a provider that meets your needs, here's what I can tell you we have checked on these providers. These programs do not have a lot of restrictions and oversight on the providers because it is parent choice and they want parents to be able to have whatever they want. Um, in essence, be able to choose lots of different types. So what we are checking when they sign up to be a provider is that the staff that are working with children are licensed in the area that they're doing services. So if they're offering speech therapy, they need to be a speech therapist and have a license. They also need to have current BCI and FBI background checks. So they do those every five years. They need to provide us health and safety information for their facility. Usually that's at least a fire inspection. If they're a school or a daycare center, then it's also a health inspection. They have to have insurance. They need to have certain policies in their handbook about what their fees are. They have to have policies about non-discrimination, termination, discipline, things like that. So we look that they have those written policies. And then they do have to have a formal tuition and fee structure that they share with us. We don't dictate that fee structure to them. They can charge whatever they want. The state has no control. They're private businesses or private schools. So as a parent, you want to shop around. Even if you've gone someplace and you're like, this place is fantastic, I love it. Go to three other places, see what they charge, see if they're also fantastic. Um, we had a school who we just found out is charging $170 an hour for group intervention services, so like a resource room class. We have other schools that charge 30 bucks for that. So it can be, it can be a big variation, that's adorable. Um, between the pricing structure of some of these providers. You only have so much money to spend, and so you have to budget this whole thing a little bit. So you want to look at that tuition and fee schedule, and they should be providing that information when you visit them. I did um, can we, can give you... I don't want to put sure. the cart ahead of the horse here, but what if the school that we're looking at does not have meet those qualifications today, mm -hmm. but we would like to have them work on it. So they're not a provider now? Correct. Mm -hmm. If they want to become a provider, they just contact us and we talk them through the process. Um, if they have most of the things in place, particularly if they're already a school, yep. they're 90% of the way there. So Usually the, the thing that they have to do is hire special education staff. 
Okay. Because typically if I'm, you know, St. Catherine's Catholic school, I've existed for a long time. Kids have come to me. Kids with disabilities have been coming to me for years. But the services they've been getting have been through that IDEA auxiliary funding and the district has provided maybe a speech therapist or a reading tutor to my school for those kids. Now, if I'm gonna be a Peterson provider, I have to provide that special education, so I'm gonna to have to hire that speech therapist. Does that necessarily mean that they have to be full-time? No. Okay, no. So. The schools usually, when they start out, typically will maybe hire a full-time intervention specialist. That's kind of the most important thing they have to have at all these schools is that intervention specialist, because they're gonna be doing all the academic work, yep. working with the teachers on accommodations, behaviors, things like that. So that's kind of step one. But that person may not even have to be full-time if they're only starting with a few kids in their program. And then they sometimes will contract in speech, OT, things like that. They may have somebody who, from a local speech therapy office who just comes in one day a week to see their couple of kids who need it. So they can start small and then build their program as they go and as the kids get different needs, more needs, more kids. So this so is a little... Oh, go ahead. So, and if the school wants to apply, where do they go to apply? Um, they can email the Peterson Scholarship okay. Program and let us know that they're interested and we can send them back information. That's usually the easiest way to do it. They can go on our website, but it's okay. a little overwhelming to go that way. Sometimes we can just give them the pieces they need to get started. Or they can call us. Okay. You've got my card there. You can, they can call me directly. Yes? So you're saying the school has to have an intervention specialist on staff, or can they have a teacher that's going to designate it like if my child were to be the only one with a disability at the school, they are going to hire a full-time person. Just they working. have to have a licensed intervention specialist okay. working for them. That okay. could be a contracted person who comes one day a week. That could be a full-time person. That could be an on-staff teacher who happens to also have an intervention license who kind of does both. Okay. Now we're not, again, for one kiddo, that might work. But if realistically speaking, we're not going to usually let them set up a program where their fourth grade teacher is also their intervention specialist, unless they've also set up an arrangement where that fourth grade teacher has three periods off a day that she can go intervene, because otherwise she's not available for your child. Okay. So they do have to have that person there and working with the kids that they've taken. Okay. So there is a particular but it doesn't have to be license that is an intervention specialist license. Yes. Okay. Or special education teaching license. Okay. They've changed the name of it a few times, so there's three different licenses that are the same kind of thing that we'll accept for that. Um, this form, and you can take a few extras of these if you're actually going out to look at schools or make copies of it. This is kind of a cheat sheet for that looking at providers piece. When you go to private schools, private schools are different from public schools. This was originally designed for the Ed Choice Scholarship Program, but you can use it um, if you're looking at private schools across the board. What you find out when you go to a private school is that things are different. You're not necessarily guaranteed busing from your district, but you might get it, and we'll talk about that. Um, they might have some fees. The scholarship usually goes to tuition, services. They may have some extra fees that wouldn't be covered that you need to know about. Um, different schools offer different things. Not all public schools have music programs anymore, which is crazy, but some private schools don't either. Now, some private schools are going to have more comprehensive sports, music, and arts than your local public school does. Some are going to have less. So you just want to know before you, know, you sign your child up who's really interested in music with this private school, then find out they don't have a music program. That would be bad. So it just helps you kind of organize some information and ask those questions. I know when I started to look at daycare centers, everyone's like, oh, you need to make sure you ask the right questions. And I had no idea what the right questions were. My question was always, are you going to be nice to my child, please, for eight hours a day? That's what I want. Please just be nice <laughs> for eight hours, because that's hard. Um, so, you know, that's my obvious question. But these are some more practical ones, just so that you make sure you get all the information about these places that you're visiting. Um, this is how you actually apply. We put a lot of the work onto the providers. And we tried to take as much work as possible off of the parents because we know what you're handling already in your life. So it's a one-page application form. You get it from the provider. So once you visited, looked at some other providers, figured out who you want to get this scholarship with, they'll give you the paper, one page, your name, address, spouse's name, address, child's name, address. It's very simple stuff. You sign it, you hand it back to them. They're going to put it into the computer system that we have that's an online secure system. When they submit that application for you, an alert goes to your public school district 
your public school district will respond by uploading a copy of your current ETR and IEP, entering some information about that into the system, and approving or denying you. If you have a current IEP, you're eligible. They won't deny you. They can't. It's not optional. Um, but if you apply before you had those things in place or something like that, or if you don't really live in their district, you live in a neighboring district and you just didn't know, uh, that kind of thing might stall it. And if they did have a concern or a question, they just send it back to your provider for additional information, and it goes back and forth until it goes through. This is not a lengthy process. We accept applications year-round for the John Peterson program now. Um, we used to have deadlines. We don't. So you can apply at any time. If you come in later in the year, you don't get the whole amount. You get less scholarship if you come in later. Our year is July to June. So it's the state fiscal year. Compulsory attendance. I mentioned this a couple times. We're going to talk about it. Compulsory attendance is the law that says that your child has to go to school. It's been around for a very long time. Um, they decided at some point back in, I don't know, the 40s or so, that you can't keep your kiddos down on the farm. They need to go to school. And they keep expanding the age range of how long they have to go to school. Currently, if your child is age 6 to 18, they need to be in school. So school can be your public school system, or it could be a private school, what we in Ohio call chartered non-public, because we like to make it longer. Um, chartered non-public school is just a fancy word for a private school. So that's fine, they can go to those kind of schools. If you choose a provider that is not a school as your primary provider, and I'll give an example here in Cincinnati, Applied Behavioral Services, they are a provider for the Autism Scholarship Program. They do an ABA program. They are typically a full day program, nine to three. They are not a school. Looks a lot like school, they do a lot of academic things with kids during the day, but it's not a school. So if you choose a program like that, then you would be required to register with your school district as a homeschooling parent, provide for them the curriculum you're gonna do with your child. If your provider is doing English and math things with your child, then you can write down what things they're doing on that. But you might have to still do phys ed and science at home if they're not covering that. Um, so there are specific classes you have to do. There's information about homeschooling on ODE's website that you can look at, it has a sample registration form. But that's something to think about when you're looking at provider choices that if you're not prepared to take that responsibility on, then you may want to look for a school. If you're ready to try that and you think that's the best fit for your kiddo, we can help you through how to do that. Um, the system that I talked about, where you can get on and apply that your providers submit the application on, parents can actually get a view account. So if you're interested in being in the program, you should definitely set one of these up and then you can watch your application go through, you can see progress reports, you can watch the billing, all of that good information. The first step to that is setting up a safe account and then you have to access our scholarship system and verify your child. I'm just gonna flip you through some screens so you can see what that looks like. This is ODE's website homepage. Up at the top, there's this tiny little safe that I highlighted. The account that you get to access things in ODE is called a safe account. It is just your secure username and password. Oops. You come in here when you click on that button and you can create a safe account unless you happen to already be a teacher or something and have one. When you create it, you're going to indicate that you're a parent signing up for scholarship. You can't do this until after they've submitted your child's application, but once they've done that, you definitely would want to set this up. 